starting uh kcth office start, start okay uh, so we'll begin with the session um, um just a, a audio check and a video check uh, it's fine devashish uh, yeah it's fine okay thank you okay uh, so respected speakers and participants at the outset i would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone uh, on this discussion on global opportunities in digital healthcare this session is jointly conducted by the ug academic council and the koita center for digital health kcdh iit bombay i'd like to quickly introduce kcdh through a video and devashish will just uh, share his screen priority for all countries in the world, digital health has proven to be a very effective tool in improving quality, access, and cost of healthcare. Consequently, digital health is one of the fastest growth areas in technology. India too is investing heavily in digital health technology. The government is rolling out the Ayushman Bharat digital mission across India, which will drive new healthcare solutions, similar to the impact of Aadhaar and UPI on financial solutions. Digital health has substantial benefits for healthcare and its stakeholders, patients, hospitals, government organizations, doctors. We are really excited to support IIT Bombay in setting up the Center for Digital Health. Koita Center for Digital Health or KCDH drives research entrepreneurship and employment in digital health. The center is the first of its kind in India and our vision is to establish KCDH as a globally renowned center in digital health and digital health informatics. KCDH is proud to have a world-class advisory board with renowned members from diverse backgrounds, including directors of renowned hospitals, professors from top universities, and a senior executive of leading health Tech firms. We offer world-class academic programs in healthcare informatics and we groom an exceptional cadre of students. Our students work on fascinating projects through internships and placements at some of the best companies in digital health. The center offers a wide range of courses in computer science, AI and machine learning, medical imaging, healthcare data management, healthcare economics and healthcare ethics. These uh, courses are taught not just by IIT faculty but by faculty visiting from various leading hospitals and research institutes. Partnering with expert clinical professionals, that's our key priority area. The center is actively involved in applied research development activities and facilitates collaborations between engineers, clinicians to solve real world healthcare challenges with access to clinical data and expertise. We are establishing collaborations with leading hospitals, healthcare organizations, and healthcare regulators to drive collaborations in research and teaching programs, funding, and policy. The center is committed to providing meaningful internship and career opportunities for our students. Digital healthcare is poised for a massive transformation in India. We are excited that the center can contribute to accelerating digital health adoption in India, which in turn will positively impact healthcare outcomes. We invite you all to join us and be part of our center. Thank you, Devashish. Um, now, let's begin our session with an introduction of our speakers. Professor Devraj Shah is currently working as a professor at the Department of EECS and is a member at the Institute for Data Systems and Society and Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems and the Director at Statistics and Data Science Center. He is the Principal Investigator at the MIT Institute for Foundations of Data Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. He is also the co-founder of two startups, Select Inc. and Ikigai. He has also authored various publications and has received many awards for the same. Joining him will be Professor Ganesh Ramakrishnan, Institute Chair Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and Professor in Charge of the Koita Center for, the, for Digital Health, KCDH, at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, India. 
Apart from various publications in state-of-the-art AI and DL techniques, Ganesh sir has received many awards for technology advancement and impactful research from the likes of IRCC, Adobe, IBM, etc. We thank our speakers for taking time out for the session today. Also, all right. So now, India is taking massive leaps in the digital healthcare space. The most notable being Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission that has been launched by our Honorable Prime Minister in September 2021. Through the discussion today, I hope our participants get a clear perspective on the scope and importance of the field on a global scale. I encourage all our participants to actively participate in the same by posting all the questions in the chat box and we will address them in the end. To begin with the discussion, I'd like to pose my first question to Dev Devrat sir. Sir, could you please give us an overview of your thoughts on the intersection of health and technology? First of all, uh, uh, Prakriti, uh, uh, thanks for hosting us. Uh, uh, Ganesh, thanks for organizing this. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, also, thank you for sharing the, uh, the brief overview of the Koita Center. Uh, definitely uh, very impressive the way that things have come together and it was very educational for me and very thrilled to see what's happening in my alma mater uh, IIT Bombay. Um, now coming to your question about um, intersection of uh, uh, let's call it health and technology or digital health and technology. Uh, to begin with as you uh, briefly read my uh, uh, biography clearly I'm a lot more on the or primarily on the technology side in particular uh, uh, my interests have been at the interface of thinking about how does one design algorithms to extract information from uh, data uh, especially unstructured data or new types of data where uh, things are emerging and this is one place where uh, as um, as an observer of the interface uh, i would like to say that there are lots of interesting sensors or data sources that are emerging. So if we think of um, uh, uh, cellular sensors, cellular sensors that is cell level, uh, like single cell data, now things are becoming a spatial. Um, these are at genetic level, at the protein level, at a different molecular level. We are collecting so much detailed information out there. And then the question is that how do these things have anything to do with the ultimately as a system level or clinical level outcomes. Uh, I mean, this, uh, as we all know, at least uh, from, uh, at least from uh, uh, 10 feet or 100 feet perspective, uh, biological systems are studied at different uh, scales. There's a clinical level and then there's a system level and then there is a uh, 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 physiological level and now molecular level. And just understanding relationship between these things is definitely a fundamental scientific challenge. While um, many in the uh, health field, broadly defined, have been trying to understand the science behind it because they have the expertise. I think potentially uh, somebody like me uh, and uh, some of us on this call as engineers uh, and let's call it broadly data scientists can help them provide the tools and techniques to actually um, uh, make fast progress. And in the process, we as a data scientist can actually build new techniques and methods that we have not done before. So I think it's, it could be extremely fruitful, collaborative, and I think impact as uh, very nicely put out in your introductory video is uh, definitely uh, massive. So definitely very exciting times to say the least. I'd like to also chip in that uh, as much as uh, Professor Devarath is excited to see this initiative at his alma mater, we are very excited to have you, despite an extremely hectic schedule, he's got gotten back very late uh, yesterday night, uh, and uh, he's joined early this morning. He's very tight today as well. Thanks, David. Well, no, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a wonderful start to the discussion. So, um, yeah, uh, this question of mine is directed to Ganesh sir. Uh, so, sir, compared to India, the U.S. healthcare system has a very extensive engagement with technology, like with wearables, with radiograph image quality enhancement, telemedicine. So, um, if uh, if I were to ask you, like, in what aspects does India lag behind, and like, how can it improve? Thanks for the question, Prakriti. Um, 
I personally believe, and I, based on my conversation with some of the digital health experts in USA, it's just reinforced that India should not only try to just catch up. We can leapfrog. We have to. I think it's best to be grounded in the challenges, the needs in India at large, while certainly learning both from the rights and the wrongs, the mistakes that have been performed elsewhere. So this is an opportunity for us to leapfrog, both in terms of equipment, the footprint that they leave. Think of the simple MRI. Right now, MRI devices, do we really need uh, high resolution devices? Could we really make them small? Could we make them accessible in the remotest corner of the country? And yet use AIML, use mathematics to bring the images back to high resolution through the construction. So I think there's there's a lot of scope for being innovative. Um, we must also understand that the Indian ecosystem is very different from the US uh, the healthcare, which is very much pivoted on the, the insurance uh, ecosystem. So even the electronic health records here cater largely to the insurance providers. So we could have a lot more patient, the user. I would not even say patient, the users, because we, we are talking about healthcare and not just medicine. Uh, and with that in mind, also make sure that the doctors who are significantly smaller in number compared to the patient, we have a very skewed patient to doctor, uh, doctor to patient ratio in India. How do we make sure that the doctor's time is well utilized? So I think we have very interesting challenges, lot to learn, obviously from um, uh, several experts in the US. Yet at the same time, we should be trying to leapfrog. Yeah, as you said, there are challenges, but ours are different challenges. So I'm, I'm sure we can overcome them. We do a bit of brainstorming, right? Um, so yeah. So my next question would be to Dev Prat, sir. Uh, so sir, every year, uh, like every few years, better to say, every few years we always see there's a boom in a particular technology. You know, in today's time, it's probably like machine learning, AI, and then uh, with the advent of the metaverse, it's AR and VR as well. So as you said, you are more on the technology side. So is there some particular technology that you feel that, you know, it might be really promising in the digital healthcare space in the near future? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll again go back to the, the uh, uh, two things, right? One is uh, uh, the, uh, the new types of biological sensors that are coming out. Uh, they are generating large amounts of data, but uh, while there has been a lot of, uh, lot of hype, there, uh, implications have been limited. The second one is um, uh, and been um, uh, nicely uh, exhibited recently through these quotes and quotes what people call platform technologies for developing uh, or doing drug discovery, where there is a, uh, a structured platform way, just the way we think of in technology space, where we designed a software system and then uh, different variations of them on top of that lead to, uh, let's say, Python as a language, because I'm pretty sure all of you are pretty familiar with Python. Python as a language, developing a language and then sort of small variations lead to different programs, different outcomes. Uh, that actually uh, speeds up innovation quite a bit. Uh, it also speeds up uh, you know, the process of going from uh, lab to the actual drugs, because uh, some of the uh, some of the processes such as safety and all of those things are already sort of taken care of before. So for example, going back to things like uh, um, uh, uh, vaccine like Moderna and Pfizer. And again, I understand this very little, but I'm sort of speaking as a dis from a distance as an observer, where if the next version of such uh, vaccines have to be released, potentially we don't need uh, another sort of long phase one clinical trial. Uh, it's all about sort of whether it's effective or not, not about the safety. And that sort of speeds things up quite a bit. Hopefully the same thing can be done in other diseases as well. So I think that's another place where uh, it's useful. And the third thing is coming to what uh, uh, Prakriti, your question uh, brought a very nice answer from Ganesh in terms of, you know, uh, India is particularly exciting uh, not because India has to catch up with uh, India, uh, sorry, US. I think India has just a different sets of challenges. 
which means that the innovation coming out of that would actually help us in my mind provide uh, healthcare at much more affordable uh, rate you see one of the challenges in us in healthcare uh, us is healthcare system is designed extremely well to do a really good um, let's call it uh, healthcare providing for those tail patients you know uh, uh, very difficult cancer care okay us has done really really well that's where lots of advanced research is that's where lots of clinicians are uh, who have done an amazing job however when it comes to day to day stuff the cost of healthcare has gone uh, has been growing astronomically and the growth is just if you put the basic macroeconomics there i think growth is unsustainable so something got to give and i feel one of the opportunities that uh, india has through initiatives such as what koita center is doing is to provide sort of a new ways to pro, uh, deliver health care so that the cost is reduced quite a bit while remaining consistent with let's call it basic basic health care protocol so i feel that there is a and uh, you know necessity is uh, uh, always the mother of innovation and india is place where sort of as uh, ganesh pointed out we have sort of challenges in terms of number of patients is to number of doctors and how the country is so i i'm really counting on you all to actually sort of show the world how to sort of deliver healthcare uh, efficiently quickly and meaningfully at least at the mass scale right um yeah that's a good point thank you sir um yeah um so yeah uh, again my next question will be to you again dev sir um so we know that the uh, adoption of technology in healthcare is fairly low globally like when we compare it to other sectors like maybe finance or some of the other sectors so uh, if a student is like considering a career in digital healthcare uh, so could you like uh, stress on the paths that they can explore both in the industry as well as the research track yeah so i think that um uh, so uh, i presume prakriti given that you are asking in the context of this conversation maybe you are even asking a question in the context of how does a, a technology uh, background uh, uh, driven student how does she or he may think about pursuing a career in the healthcare space coming from uh, uh, from especially from the lens of digital health so there are again lots of um, uh, interesting different types of opportunities uh one being um and many of the students i work with currently have been uh uh working with me so i'll ex- i'll explain one example and maybe that example kind of help um uh, so recently uh and we are in the process of publishing this uh this work uh uh my group over past four to five years has been spending time thinking about uh questions related to how to extract information from what people call observational data for the purpose of understanding impact of different interventions on outcomes of threats for example if one implements certain policy and one uh, one says this policy has been effective in doing certain things uh, you just observe implementation of policy and outcomes but you don't really observe sort of the experiment right uh, a country never implements two policies and say well for half of you it's a policy a half of you it's policy b and let's see what happens and even if we did that there will be sort of uh, lots of interference right that like ganesh getting policy a and you getting policy b well of course you know that ganesh is getting policy a so that's uh, uh, so there's extracting information from this data is very hard now if we go back to this classical uh, 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 method that we all uh, utilize in the clinical studies like randomized control trial you know a patient get a drug you have two options uh, let's say i'm a patient 1 and somebody is patient 2 i get drug 1 somebody get drug 2 and we are randomly assigned all the patients getting drug 1 sort of uh, show something all the patient getting drug 2 show something and then we compare the eventual health outcome to decide what is the uh, what is the uh, whether so drug 1 is effective or drug 2 is effective right standard thing. now in many settings what happens is that especially like alzheimers a patient goes through uh, the trials for a long time like couple of years and because of that if you are a, and then some impact of in of drugs on alzheimer patient is very limited you see their goal is to stop cognitive 
decline. Uh, they don't cure you. So what happens is that if a patient uh, is getting a placebo, it's likely that the patient would realize over a period of a uh, year that it's not helping. And hence they would say, I'm not, I don't want to spend so much time and effort being part of the trial and I'm going to drop off. Versus other patients who are actually going through maybe real drug and maybe things are just remaining constant, they might continue. On the other hand, patients who have gotten placebo, they might randomly, you know, there's randomness, they might randomly start doing well and hence they may remain on the, uh, on the trial. So what that means is that effectively, you have patients on placebo, people who did not do well will drop out, people who are doing well will continue, and people on dr drug, well, hopefully, let's say they're, most of them are doing well, they're still there. But now if you compare the outcomes among placebo and the drug, you will find that, hey, um, uh, both of them are looking the same. So now sort of drug is not effective, but actually it is effective. And this is happening because of the biasing that's coming out in data, despite the RCT, a randomized control trial. So how do you correct for these kind of bias? And this is the type of uh, uh, study we took, uh, uh, collaborated with, with the pharmaceutical company who put that drug through phase three trial. And we showed that there's a significant bias induced by dropout and one can correct for it. And this was great for us because it helped us validate uh, some of the state-of-the-art method that we developed. At the same time, it is helping the, the company both uh, think through the next level of clinical trials as well as you know, help make the case for their drug and do some science better. Uh, now, of course, I don't think I can sort of help them do science better, but maybe I can sort of help in this small way doing the data analysis. So this is one potential way to do that. A little bit more um, involved way to do that is to go and actually start collaborating with these individuals. For example, one thing that uh, some of us are trying to do and more of a broader ecosystem is help build um, uh, data infrastructure for clinicians because many of them are connecting these data at scale and then they want sort of some kind of insights coming out of it as they do day-to-day -day things. And while there are many infrastructures, they're still not sort of completely usable infrastructure out there. The third one, which going back to the lab uh, space, um, many are developing uh, this very detailed cellular data. And again, as I mentioned, data is a lot, but understanding is limited and they need new methods. So this is another place where uh, strong involved collaboration where technologists understands biology and biologists understand a little bit of technology would help a lot. So there are many uh, such opportunities. And at this stage, pharmaceutical companies are eager to recruit uh, technologists, uh, young technologists, potentially practically like yourself. Uh, so I think uh, it's a, a limits are endless. Right. Uh, yeah, just echoing what you said in the end, the lim it's limitless. So it just depends on what your interest is, right? Um, right. So um, yeah, Devrat said, um, Ganesh sir, I'll come to you in a bit, but uh, just just that uh, since Devrat sir has a bit of a time crunch, um, is it okay if I pose like uh, the last question, if you are okay with it? Or would you have some time for another two questions maybe? Sure, I'm, uh, uh, I think questions for me or questions for Ganesh? Right, I'll, right. I think she's asking if she could pose two questions to you. Would you have the time? That's fine. Of course, of course. Sounds right. good, yes. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, so in the healthcare industry, particularly, we know that privacy and confidentiality is of utmost concern. You know, you're dealing, you're directly dealing with people's personal data. And we're also aware of certain outrage against certain tech giants. I won't name it, but everyone knows it. So, uh, like for certain privacy, privacy breaches that happened recently. So, uh, Regarding that, like what suggestions would you have for data security in like uh, scalable systems? Like if that would yeah, so be a career option. Yeah, no, I think that, again, this is another uh, amazing question. So uh, Prakriti, thank you for uh, leading to a, a meaningful answer. <laughs> uh, 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 there are lots of um, uh, interesting uh, challenges and uh, opportunities, I would say, uh, putting it the other way, to design these uh, let's call it privacy preserving data infrastructures. Uh, 
there's an interesting uh, article that came out recently about US census use, utilizing uh, there's a notion of differential privacy, where they take the data and then they uh, fuzz it up a little bit in a meaningful manner uh, so that you can't pin down precise things, but you can pin down approximate things. And of course, the article was saying that, well, looks like uh, as per the current US census, some of the people are living in the rivers in Chicago because their locations were a little bit fuzzed up. Now, of course, um, uh, jokes aside, uh, I think these type of approaches are uh, great initial approaches. Of course, they're, they're not necessarily the best end goal, but maybe hopefully uh, collectively uh, we would evolve to a place where data can be stored in that uh, encrypted manner and then the meaningful computations can be done even though data is encrypted. Like this is a, a group of students, uh, sorry, group of researchers doing uh, things like holomorphic computation uh, a decade ago, where the idea was that data is encrypted. And so if you have a function that you want to compute on the data, you can actually encrypt the function first, compute it, and decrypt the function back. So that output, you can sort of get it without sort of actually uh, 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 revealing the data itself. Now, of course, this is limited because you can't have all sorts of uh, functions done. So the question is that how far can we go with things like that? Um, coming to uh, uh, more pragmatic things, uh, for example, at the company we've built Ikikai Labs, uh, we are completely HIPAA compliant. Okay, that is, any PII information in our cloud setups remains, we can produce a HIPAA compliance certificate uh, instantly. It was a process, but uh, we achieved it. But my hope is that maybe next generation of uh, startups that come around, uh, that process should not be that complicated. Like, for example, a uh, few of our technology, uh, uh, the member of our engineering team have put out a very detailed blog of how to go about doing it. Um, and uh, so at least as far as uh, business is concerned, we have, a, let's call it a license to store the personally identifiable information. Question is, that, is HIPAA compliance enough? Uh, I'm not sure. I think that needs to evolve. Um, but so there are those two extremes where, you know, uh, maybe a technology's frontier would sort of tell where HIPAA compliance should evolve and maybe the process of becoming HIPAA compliant going forward for the new startups and new companies would not be that complicated. And somewhere in between is where uh, uh, a young talent like yourself would help us move forward in both domains. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, coming back to Ganesh, sir, Sir, uh, you had mentioned about challenges that the Indian market is facing. So uh, could you like suggest areas where we need to focus on to resolve or like minimize, at least minimize some of these issues? Um, thanks, Prakriti. While we acknowledge that we are sitting on a lot of data, um, and thankfully, Koita Center for Digital Health has gotten started by engagement with several hospitals by design rather than a piecemeal siloed approach of interaction. The, a very important lesson to learn from experiences, and I would say even solutions in the US, is how to respect the privacy of the patients and of the doctors, the interventions at scale. I think uh, I'm going to some of the points that uh, Devarath made. Uh, the simple task of making de-anonymized data accessible at scale across hospitals to the researchers. I mean, what's the right access control protocol? We need to learn a lot of that, even the design of the solutions. While some of the solutions uh, in the US have been evolved, I mean, companies which are offering these solutions. Uh, in India, not clear whether we need to go down that path. So therefore, the challenge is going to be learning from the specs I mean, the blog that uh, they would refer to is it would be very useful for us, obviously. Please do share it with us. Um, so how do we translate that into solutions in the Indian context? We are sitting on uh, 15 exciting projects that got started through the initial seed round funding, thanks to Rizwan and Rekha, their uh, Koita uh, Foundation's contribution. Now, these 15 projects, how do we make sure that the data access follows a process that is sustainable to 150 to 1500 and that way right so um, i think this is going to be our one important challenge 
the other is given that the Ayushman Bharat digital mission is already on its rollout. How do we make sure that the feedback from the frontline workers, uh, the ASHA workers, the actual practitioners, that goes, that percolates all the way to the top, to the designer, right? The design of the sandbox environments that Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission is offering already. So I would say, uh, while the, the first one was more of the software ecosystem, uh, which will also include a lot of the gene sequencing work, there's a lot to learn from our US counterparts there, They're absolutely mind boggling, both the data sharing and the, the, the cellular data association with the intervention. The other thing, other challenge is, is really about the, um, the ecosystem which connects the frontline workers with the bureaucrats, with the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of designers, the te technology de designers at the top. I think that's another space where the Koita Center could make an, a very important contribution, especially given that Koita Foundation and several other foundations we are connected with are dealing with the frontline workers and their capacity building. I would say these are two major areas uh, for us to learn from one where we can uh, you know, seriously bootstrap around experiences in the US and uh, the second one which is very unique to India. Right, right. We should make sure to keep those in mind, right? Those are good points. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, just as you said, we are sitting on a lot of data and that data is pretty scattered and unorganized as of now. So. Like uh, when we deal with huge, large data sets, like considering the population of India, like what are some of the best practices for data mining and consolidation of that data? This is a question to? Aganesh, sir. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, it's important to understand that machine learning, AI have significantly evolved today that you probably don't need to share all the data, make all the data accessible. There's this important notion of federated learning. Right? What is federated learning? You don't really pass the data on, but you pass the right data summary. And the data summary could be in the context of the deep learning or the machine learning model. I mean, it could be in the form of what we call gradients. Right? Obviously, we need to be much smarter than passing gradients. Uh, we also want to make sure that the uh, this process of federated learning, which involves some amount of computation at the clients, doesn't become too heavy and overbearing to the clients. So uh, I, I think the, uh, we also need to redesign or uh, uh, retrofit some of the data sharing processes, keeping in mind advances in the space of you know deep learning and AI, which is for real. Um, so I would say um, while you know, ensuring privacy is of utmost importance, um, we could probably again leapfrog on the process by which this data gets used to build predictive models. Right. Thank you, sir. Um, so sure, I'm sure Professor Devarath would have something to add. Uh, I know he's running a little tight on the schedule. Would you like to just chip on this very important uh, question? And, no, I, I think Ganesh, your answer is perfect. I, I feel that one of the other things that is uh, uh, Prakriti, you, uh, you and men, especially many students on the call have been thinking about uh, one advice for what it's worth. Uh, and of course, feel free to <laughs> completely ignore it. And this is more like my narrating my experience. Uh, I found that um, there are two extremes. We, uh, we all sort of uh, work really well as academic uh, slash uh, let's call it uh, optimistic thinkers. One extreme is where uh, as, a, as a simply a theorist trying to develop methods. And I, I, by theorist, I don't mean necessarily a mathematical theorist, but somebody who is sort of theorizing things and saying that here's, let's say, the things I have and I'm going to go and sort of try to do this and then it will solve the world's problem. I don't know what the world problem is, but and a hard extreme challenge there, well-defined there, many of them can actually do a great job eventually. Another possibility is just be pragmatic and say, well, I have certain tools and techniques that I'm very good at. Uh, I, I understand all of that, but let me just go and look at one simple problem out there. One simple problem uh, and let me sort of do something, even though all it requires is just developing uh, yet another app. Uh, let me just develop it. And 
see if I it, that makes uh, that changes few things the way they are done. And if that is done, and then sort of follow the follow your nose after that, I think that would take you to a place where not even the best of theorists would be able to take you. So again, this sounds very um, uh, very uh, counterintuitive that uh, you know as as an academic who sort of been teaching uh, as effectively as old as Ganesh. He's younger, of course, but uh, uh, I'm sort of giving you this very pragmatic advice. But I feel that sort of at the end of the day, problems lead to solution, not the theory. But th that doesn't mean that you ignore theory, right? It's very, very important. It is, it is what sort of brings you uh, in the place to sort of solve the problem. But uh, so keep that in mind. Yes. Yeah, so um, so yeah, so our participants, they have got sort of on a tight schedule today and he, he specifically took out time for our session today. And uh, I think he would have to leave now. We already are over time. I'm really sorry for that. But no, uh, we'll don't. continue the session with Ganesh sir here onwards. Thank you so much for your Thanks. time, Deepak sir. It was indeed a very informative discussion and some of your answers were really like insightful. And we look forward to many more such interactions with you in the future. Thank you so much. Of course, and I uh, appreciate having me here, Ganesh. Uh, my apologies for you know uh, changing schedules a little bit uh, and not able to see you in person right now. But I hope to see you and others on uh, IIT Bombay campus, hopefully in the very near future. Is that and, and as uh, David takes his leave. Um, we are planning on a workshop. So I've been visiting several top medical schools and their collaborations with uh, in schools of engineering here in the US. I'll jump summarize that probably after David leaves. But uh, one of the outcomes has been that we could have a workshop early next year, and David has offered uh, to be there. So I'm, I'm sure that might be an opportunity for us to see him personally as well. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, thanks Thank for taking you. out the time. Yeah. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. So I'd like to just again uh, piggyback on this important point that Devarath uh, brought up. Some specific interventions, what we call the vertical, if you can take uh, them from the source to the sink, with the source to the problem solution, I think many best practices will emerge and we would be able to attract also the right kind of complementary help from expertise here at the US universities. Um, and this is a, a very constructive advice we've received. I've received it from uh, the John Hopkins University, GHU. Um, they, they, we have, they, we have the, they have the top biomedical engineering school in the US. Um, I, I've received this advice from the University of Michigan. I was at Stanford. There's a Center for Digital Health there and also the School for Biodesign. I received this from Berkeley as well, which is uh, uh, which was a couple of days earlier. And now I'm at, at Boston, um, met Deva Vrat, uh, met Professor R Ramesh Raskar, met Professor Yogesh Rathi at Howard. Uh, Ramesh Raskar is at uh, MIT. And, and this is kind of a consistent advice. Just plunge, take, uh, take up a problem from its source to the sink, and all the learnings through the way will certainly help a sleep frog in other verticals as well. So I'll, I'll probably uh, discuss a little bit more on that as we proceed. Yeah. Right. Sorry. So yeah, considering you're talking about verticals, like a lot of us, when we are, when we finally decide that we are, um, you know, interested in software, we spend our time developing a lot of skills like ML or DL or uh, computer vision or NLP. So if we want to like take a particular uh, subject and delve deep into it like uh, for a particular like for a an absolute novice like how does he decide how does he go about the process like choosing his uh, field of interest and then uh, like you know learning technologies particularly to go deep in that subject how do we do go about that so prakriti i would uh, make the following humble suggestion students need not be overwhelmed with jargon and technology to begin with. Um, I think sometimes very, very basic fundamental questions come from students who are learners or seekers, and they add a lot of value even to the solution providing. 
because often what happens is we get overwhelmed i mean assuming that i i know certain areas very well i get overwhelmed with what i know rather than what is the need so students can basically help see the discussion with very important fundamental questions which are pivoted on the solution on solving the problem rather than the means required to solve the problem <clears throat> but having said that <clears throat> um, uh, when i talk about verticals I, i'm also i'm not necessarily talking about the method i'm talking about a solution a, a problem space for example nutrition if you know that um, malnutrition is a big issue in india but also the right in nutrition the correct for, uh, form of nutrition is as important um and without the correct form of nutrition we see you know diabetes for example is uh, is a very big issue right <clears throat> in the in the middle class in the lower middle class as well in india so therefore taking a problem that spans the entire you know strata of the society and seeing where can we actually bring a solution this requires sometimes an open mind okay so students with an open mind can bring a lot of value don't be overwhelmed necessarily with solutions even as you are learning how to build solutions right um uh, uh, one thing i've learned uh, over the years is instead of being consumers of technology let's be producers of technology and how can we be producers of technology one way is to think of alternatives increase the search space instead of being focused on you know the use of a particular methodology diabetes through medication that's really closing the search space but imagine addressing diabetes through improved lifestyle through uh, you know nutrition improved nutrition and yes there's also medication now you have increased the search space so uh, more of lateral thinking bringing more technology alternatives and uh, the so the perspective which um, have driven those technology alternatives can be a lot more liberating you, you we need to democratize the solution space we need to create a more level playing field for different alternatives so i think students can add a lot of value there now once you have those you have identified potential alternatives i mean in fact the process of exploring those alternatives will also help you discover what are the courses you are interested in right uh, it's no one size fits all right so you um, so i think it's it's a kind of iterative process where you expand now imagine this case of diabetes right you you think that well i think i'm quite excited about bringing solutions through better uh, nutrition for diabetes Uh, um, now this also requires a lot of uh, technology i mean for example you would like to profile the, uh, the cellular data for an individual based on the kind of diet she or he eats and uh, model the microbiome in the in conjunction with what the content of different uh, nutritional alternatives are so you need to stitch this together in a somewhat longitudinal manner which is across time and be able to predict for individuals what they should what is probably the best diet or this this will suddenly uh, you know um, make you excited about learning about gene sequencing you would probably take a course on that um, you would like to learn a little bit more on temporal models or auto regressive models for machine learning rather than you know plunge into all kinds of machine learning models you will get a little bit more focus now this is a lot of learning that you would get even with a focused model for other alternatives in the future but i think taking a plunge trying to think through the solution could help seed the kind of courses and expertise you develop and it'll also wet your appetite because you can't eat unless you feel hungry so when you immerse yourself in a pro 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 uh, in this uh, in expanding the solution space and get excited about one line of work you are your appetite is wetted and as a result you'll also grasp these courses much better ask the right questions in those courses what i get excited about when i teach is when students ask questions with some grounding right and then that leads the entire uh, course of discussion in the class in a very constructive manner so uh, i think you'll also enjoy learning those courses asking questions doing projects which are wedded on uh, what has really better your appetite does that help prakriti right right ask the right questions is my main take away from this you know when you ask the right questions again the discussion goes in a very positive manner right right uh, so I, i'm talking about asking the right questions at different levels as the right. uh, as your journey unfolds mm -hmm. right uh, i mean just giving one example from stanford they they, they they very interesting work and sometimes it just requires simple thinking 
um, uh, thankfully at Stanford Medical School and, and they have this digital health, they, they, they got uh, access to a lot of electronic health record data. What they thought is can we model um, the process of aging and death for the elderly? Right? Just this model helped them. Uh, this is data and this, this question that they asked, kind of exploratory question they asked, help them model, build better solutions for palliative care for the old. Right? This is interesting. So um, uh, uh, there are lots of examples. For example, University of Michigan, where I was there, John Hopkins University, um, there were very specific problems that they undertook at certain points of time, and that led to this unfolding. Uh, just to uh, kind of also um, advertise a bit more, we, we're trying to work out several internship opportunities with uh, some of these universities. Um, some uh, in some instances like JHU, we are trying to also um, bootstrap around their home to Hopkins program and create a kind of complementary masters uh, a masters in uh, an area that students would like at JHU, uh, which complements uh, our masters or the, uh, or the minors that we offer through our uh, interdisciplinary dual degree program or the minors program at KCDS respectively. So lots of avenues where we can also learn from specific interventions. Your University of Michigan already offers the summer training school and they've offered to you know, extend that to our uh, students. Uh, Stanford, we are trying to work out. So uh, I think there's a lot of cross pollination that that will happen. So yeah, I just wanted a little bit of advertisement. Okay. Uh, right, I have looked at the uh, home to Hopkins uh, programs and they were really interesting, right? Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so there were uh, a few really interesting questions that uh, the participants had sent during registration. So I'll take a few of those. Uh, the first one was, uh, is it possible to create like a global repository of clinical data for like all patients, probably like identified by unique code or something? And uh, this the, this data, this uh, will be confidential to the patient, uh, like the uh, maybe the personal details. But then the clinical details will be available to all like clinicians and researchers. And then through that, like the clinicians and researchers, they can you know generate statistically strong hypotheses and understanding of the disease. So like, is it possible for such a global repository to be created? Um, my reaction to this, again, based on my interactions here and in, and in India with hospitals, is that uh, de-identification is very important. However, patient de-identification is easier said than done. You could always find other proxy features or signals which uh, you know probably narrow down the scope if not identify the patient. It may probably reduce the search space of patients. So uh, complete identification, I've been told, and I, I kind of also subscribe to it, is going to be very difficult, if not impossible. Um, given that, doing uh, or embarking on a global repository of the nature that you have talked about can be a little tricky. Um, I mean, it's it's been hard enough. <laughs> so we may think that you know the 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 EMR EHR systems across hospitals and you know the medical schools in in, in the US are networked well, but that's not the case. Um, I mean, when I talk about interventions in Stanford, it's really based on the, um, the the Stanford engineering discipline and their interaction with the medical medical school here. Likewise, at the University of Michigan, they have a center of precision health, and the precision health center is uh, you know uh, is thriving on excellent work that they have done with the medical school, but it's their medical school and not medical schools elsewhere. So it's it's a hard enough task for them. And that, I know I was with Professor, Professor Ramesh Raskar day before at MIT, and uh, he's been trying to uh, trying to break the ice in this space in the US by uh, by kind of insisting on not necessarily data sharing, but as I said, federated learning. When, I, the, when you do federated, you can do limited data sharing, but a lot of model sharing. That's what federated learning is about. Uh, and he's been trying to kind of make inroads into the, uh, you know, NIH here, the the um, the authorities that take a, that call the shot. Um, so it takes a lot of time and energy, and because the space of 
more machine learning models is also evolving. Um, sometimes the old school of thought and the old system of sharing gets becomes redundant to some extent. Right. So um, I would say that instead of asking this question, whether it's whether they can be a global public repository, um, I would ask two questions. One, is there a way that the experiences across different pockets can be shared? Right? That's more. That's a, that's what we want more than data sharing. We want experience cross pollination uh, in a somewhat seamless real time manner. That's the other requirement. We don't want there to be too much lag. So I would qualify that question a bit more. Um, and uh, the second question I would ask is even if even if let's say we um, we work towards such a global repository, what are the specs? We really need to write down. I mean, uh, Stanford University, they've tried to come up with the specs uh, and it's a lot of learning. It's, it's not that anything evolved in one day and they had to reboot several times. Um, so uh, I'm sure Devrath will share the, uh, the blog written by one of his collaborators. So I think we need to, uh, it'd be great if the students think openly and try and contribute to such a spec, right? Uh, this uh, hypothetical global repository. Um, when I say spec, it's also access control. How do you, uh, we have a collaboration with eight to nine top medical universities in India. How would you uh, use this spec to convince them? Particularly think about your conversation with the director of Tata Memorial Hospital, Dr. C.S. Pramesh, the director of Narayan Hridayale, right? Um, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, the director of AIMS, Dr. Andy Guleria. How would you communicate the fact that yes, your data is going to be, uh, the privacy of the patients is going to be preserved and here's the right access control, which will not take any, or will not take much away from your clinicians. At the same time, give an opportunity for, uh, you know, the engineers to investigate and contribute back to you while preserving privacy, right? So we have, we've been working on non-disclosure agreements, etc., for a long time. Now, any write-up, any spec in the, along these lines will make an absolutely big difference. So um, I hope this, this the specs itself will uh, will kind of help evolve multiple alternatives. So let's let's try and write down these specs. Let's bring down all the experiences in writing such specifications across the world. Right, that was really insightful. Right? Um, another good question that I found there was that, uh, like uh, we've all seen the startup boom in 2021, and considering that as the digital health stack in India is expanding and it's being developed currently, you know what is the market for digital healthcare companies? Maybe established companies, maybe potential startups. What is that going to look like in the upcoming five to seven years? Um. I'm not sure if I'm the, I'm the right person to give uh, the and the answer to your question in all its details. What I can say for sure, uh, and this is again based on my conversations with the um, uh, with Dr. Praveen Gedam, who's been leading the Aishman Bharat Digital Mission, um, and he's he's voicing the collective concern of the doctors. For for the doctors, the biggest value in such a digital mission is when their efficiency gets improved and how would their efficiency be, be improved? As I said, and uh, Devrath also acknowledged that we have a very skewed doctor to patient ratio. Now, can telemedicine, I would just uh, um, uh, you know, emphasize on this one important vertical, can telemedicine help reduce that the inefficient process of data gathering from patients, inefficient process of doing some preliminary tests, Right. So that by the time the doctors ask the question, the doctors ask questions that she or he is adept at making an impact on. Right. So uh, otherwise, a lot of the work by, done by doctors today is very routine. Uh, and you know, Fitbits, we, we have all heard about it. And the, the companies such as General Electricals, the, the healthcare, we have. Uh, Dr. Shravan Subramaniam on board as our advisory board member. They'll also be happy to help. They'll be, ha be happy to mentor. Um, Dr. Bhagwati Prasad, who is our VP CEO, uh, and he's also developing a large network through other companies such as Siemens who work in this space. Now, now I don't think uh, we need to reinvent too much of hardware. Yeah, certainly some hardware needs to be built, but I think the, offering this end-to-end -end solution in the telemedicine space 
would be of great value. Uh, this would require close interaction with the doctors because you don't want to again fit a square peg in a round hole. You don't want to bring the solution to the doctor and then realize that this was totally, uh, you know, misaligned with what the doctor would have liked to see from a patient. Um, so KCDH offers that because KCDH offers your uh, your interaction with doctors in the one space, the health tech in the other space. And of course, we can bring in expertise in computation, uh, computational modeling from IIT Bombay. Um, I would say that's one very important area, uh, yeah, telemedicine, but very closely aligned with that is um, the compatibility of interventions with genetic models, right? With gene sequencing. Um, and I think that's again one place where we can leapfrog and try to avoid you know, unnecessary uh, clinical trials. Uh, David also talked about the biases in the randomized clinical trials that have been acknowledged in, in, in many other uh, cases. Uh, with epilepsy, he gave some examples, but there are many other areas where limitations of randomized clinical trials have been very seriously acknowledged. So can we again leapfrog that through uh, use of cellular data, which, which is where they were actually began. So I think these are at least two areas, If, uh, uh, but there could be many more. For example, um, you know, uh, I would say a problem I alluded to earlier, some of the imaging equipments in India are simply not accessible to the remote population. Uh, I know, for example, at MIT, there's, there's probably a startup who, who's tried to do this, which is try to downscale uh, the MRI equipments. Uh, the, the, the size, the resolution of the images as well. Do we need the, right, the resolution that MRI equipment today offers? It's a question to ask. So this would require interface with, uh, with the population at large, with uh, you know, maybe hospitals with low footprint, with doctors who are private, uh, uh, practicing privately. I, can, I think uh, uh, that's another space where, where research could be done at IIT Bombay, research could be done at KCDH, but we need entrepreneurs who would bring the market, the needs of the market to the fore from India. So uh, this is out of the third space, I would say a lot of equipment and their downsizing uh, for inclusive healthcare in the Indian context. Right. right. So uh, the key takeaways that I take from your uh, talk is that, you know, close collaboration with the mass population as well as the clinicians that can lead to a lot of good ideas that can come up. There's one question that's really interesting in the chat box. It's by Shreya Patel. And he says that uh, one might want to get into a promising sector, and that is based on the technical skills he or she possesses. But uh, for established uh, career uh, paths, like you know, finance or consult or something, it's very easy to switch careers later on. Like maybe you uh, switch teams and go to a different skill set or something. It's very easy to do that when it's an established career, right? But uh, digital healthcare as a field, it's uh, it's essentially like a, a giant in the making, if I can say that it's it's essentially in the baby phase right now. And for such an upcoming field, how uh, how does this switching work? Like, is it easy to switch fields later on, or how will it work? A, a small correction. Uh, I mean, digital health has attracted the maximum amount of funding to startups. So I think uh, the, the largest number of startups in this space, by the way. Yes, uh, there's of course an associated concern. Um, how many of such initiatives will sustain? But let me point out CTS Tech, uh, which is by our own alumnus, Mr. Rizwan Koita, it's one of the, I would say one of the big success stories of uh, you know startups from IIT Bombay uh, uh, by our own alumnus. I mean, this is it's thriving by providing solutions, software solutions to some of the other uh, you know, healthcare giants such as GE. So um, I think there are strong precedents to this in India already. Um, and with the launch of Aishwad Bharat Digital Mission, their effort to make sure that private entities have a significant role to play, I think the job mar market there is just getting even more secure. Um, just that the solutions, if they can think more on healthcare rather than medicine, I would say the sustainability would increase because you're then profiling the health of patients, which is going to be valuable information, not just data, but also wisdom. I think we need to graduate beyond wisdom. 
and then wisdom persists when you start talking about health but I mean, when, it's, when it's just medicine probably it uh, it just boils down to data alone right so um, health is going to be a perennial concern <laughs> Where, no matter where, who's, uh, what kind of jobs people are doing, health is going to be important. So I think uh, uh, we already seen enough evidence showing that this can sustain. And I'm trying to give you the principles that certainly make it most exciting. I mean, the whole space of gene sequencing itself brings to fore. I mean, during COVID, during for disease modeling, as well as the examples I give of modeling nutrition, right? It just brings to fore. The, the fact that uh, there's a lot technology can do in health modeling. There's a lot to be done still in the space of biomes or microbiomes, right? The study, it has been increasing study on, uh, you know, going away from siloed modeling of uh, our organs, our, eco, our health system to a more comprehensive modeling. There's been use of uh, system dynamics, if you've heard of it, um, which is basically we are connecting the different components and their interactions in a loop right so system dynamics has been well very well studied in some of these uh, areas to model model this the, the microbiome so uh, i would say if uh, people think more about health and the entire system rather than uh, you know just medicine alone um, there's enough evidence to show that this is going to uh, i mean this need is going to remain for a very long time if not eternity yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, yeah, so we actually covered like quite a lot in this session and uh, quite a few good points like about the collaboration with the masses as well as clinicians. And then, you know, um, yeah, quite a lot of good points that we discussed today. And uh, I convey my deepest gratitude to you, Ganesh, sir, for your valuable inputs and for your time today. And I'm sure the participants have got a good insight into the promising field that is digital healthcare. And uh, yeah, just as a concluding remark, would you like to give a message to the students who are interested in pursuing this as a career option, like your advice? So my advice is that several faculty members have actually put in a lot of effort uh, at KCDH to you know interact with hospitals, get uh, interact with uh, several implementation partners. Um, with companies and put together very interesting problems. You must have seen the dual degree, uh, the potential dual degree IEEE projects. So my appeal to students is read them, maybe interact with the faculty members and, and seriously consider this opportunity because a lot of thought has gone into that. And as you start engaging in one of those, uh, as Devarath also pointed out earlier on, you'd actually start seeing parallels to uh, the solution space, the kind of intervention in other disciplines, maybe talk to each other. So I would say the first stage is a look at the problem specs that have come up, then I mean, we pick one of them and then maybe talk to each other as well. Don't just be again in a silo, uh, talk to other dual degree counterparts, talk to, we have a new PhD program, we, we'll have PhD students, talk to them. Um, uh, we've also working with several foundations such as the Gupta Klinsky Institute, which is uh, an outreach of the John Hopkins uh, University in India. So they have an interesting footprint. They've been doing a lot of interesting work on tuberculosis modeling. So uh, maybe explore some of these uh, uh, you know, opportunities that we will be bringing from our US collaborations, explore their viability in the Indian context um, and, and, and learn from their experiences. So I would say get into our program and through our program get into all our lateral engagements and opportunities uh, by interacting with hospitals with uh, uh, faculty members and with some of the u.s collaborations thank you um so just if you could if uh, if you have a minute i just missed one question in the chat box and uh, sure. that is by a student of public policy at the center for policy studies in our uh, campus uh, the question is, do you feel there is a need for regulation in the health policy sector? And if yes, like how do you envisage the policies? So certainly, uh, regulation is of primary importance. All I would try to say here is, uh, if that can be a little bit data driven, um, given uh, you know data is becoming accessible and I mean through our e engagement with hospitals, we try to make that possible uh, at large. So 
that's my only appeal where we, we can think a little bit more data driven policy making but certainly health policy is of paramount importance uh, to ensure that we don't fall into the trap honestly it's a trap that uh, i mean some, some some of these countries have fallen into which is this insurance trap right um so uh, i i think we need to have well informed decisions um so um, i would say let's make it data driven to the extent possible right thank you so much for your insights and thank you for your time today um I someone think... uh, someone's hand has gone up right um uh, yes sir i asked the question can i uh, sorry yes. for the disturbance in the background yeah so i also wanted to know so uh, is there also a scope for policy students in in the space who have had some experience in the field of health to contribute in sort of just wanted to understand the avenues which are there for uh, policy grads in this uh, emerging field of digital health oh certainly uh, one of one of the areas which we have listed on the kcdh website if you see is uh, policy so there's a lot of scope for policy in this space just that um, uh, you'll need to interact with some of our faculty members at uh, who are associated at kcdh from the school of management and from humanities to find out what interests them so it is it'll be a little bit of discussion right so bakshish please do reach out you can talk to professor sovik um from humanities is professor indrajit from uh, from school of management and maybe there are more uh, professor ashish pande from school of management also been associated um so uh, uh, sub professor sarthak gaurav i think he is he is also with the center of policy studies and he works with a uh, 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 center for digital health so i just listed a few that came to my mind but there could be a lot more uh, so uh, um, i think uh, professor usha anand kumar probably also does something along these lines so uh, bakshish this 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 it's important for us you're trying to find faculty members who could join full time and steer some of this but at the same time uh, some of the names i listed probably you could also try reaching out to them our kcdh office if you can send out an email to them they uh, in, if you have a very specific query they'll try and also connect um, in case i have missed out names does that help bakshish yes yes that does help thank you sir thank you um thank you so much for your time sir and i uh, think we could conclude the session thank you very much have a great day and look forward to seeing lots of you uh, applying at kcdh for the dual degree programs or minor and uh, uh, notwithstanding that i look forward to seeing all of you prosper um do excellent work that is grounded in the needs in our country which is a very strong reflection of needs in other parts of the world i must tell you uh, the the universities here don't look up to india just for problem definitions but also solution space so let's just does not try and download and try and catch up let's innovate thank you very much innovate with humility thank you right thank you prakriti thank you professor ganesh just uh, you, one so i have actually floated a list of uh, ipdp projects in the chat box uh, if any would would like to go through it so they can use this link thank you i really yes. am grateful to prakriti and you know your entire team uh, devashish uh, you uh, you know spent a lot of time organizing these uh, weekend uh, discussions and besides that you are also our uh, you know uh, our basically our spokesman to the student community so i'm really glad that you very really nicely collated questions and brought them out today um I look forward to this continued interaction thank you sir thank you thank sir thank you sir